I've been a cog in the machine of corporate America for years, spending my days in a glass and steel structure that reaches skyward in a show of modernity. It's a building where elevators are usually prompt, taking us to our respective floors like well-trained horses. Yet there was something off about Elevator D, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck prickle every time I stepped inside. Most days it worked just fine, but every once in a while, instead of reaching my floor, the display would flash zero and the doors would open. The first time it happened, I stepped out, bewildered, into what appeared to be the same building, except the air was thicker, tinged with the smell of cigarette smoke and stale coffee. Reception desk had an old rotary phone. The computers were bulky machines with cathode ray tube monitors, and the people, well, they were dressed like they'd walked out of a 1980s corporate manual. Suits with padded shoulders, men with mustaches that didn't seem ironic, and everyone engrossed in actual paper newspapers. I remember feeling disoriented, questioning my sanity as I wandered around the floor. When I got back in the elevator, it took me directly to my floor in the year I belonged to, as though nothing had happened. I convinced myself it was stress, or maybe a prank orchestrated by the tech-savvy millennials in IT. However, it happened again, this time to my coworker, Lisa, who emerged from Elevator D with a look of bewilderment that I recognized immediately. We compared notes verifying the impossible, that we had both traveled to the same bygone era. Our stories attracted a mixture of disbelief and awe and unease among our colleagues. We considered reporting it, but who would believe us? Elevator D became an enigma, a subject of jokes and nervous laughter. Some have claimed to have heard faint music emanating from its walls the distant notes of a classic 80s rock ballad. Others felt a sudden drop in temperature as they passed it. But for me, Elevator D became an object of fascination, a tear in the fabric of reality that defied explanation. Each time the doors opened to floor zero, I found myself peering into a past untouched by the digital age, its people unaware that they were specters in a temporal anomaly. I never ventured far, never interacted with the people there. It felt intrusive, as if I were trespassing on a past that wasn't mine to disturb. So I'd linger near the elevator, studying the faces and fashions of a time I'd lived through but barely remembered, before returning to my own decade. The phenomenon continued sporadically over the years, New hires were initiated into the lore of Elevator D, although it remained unclear whether it was a technological glitch or something inexplicable, a sliver of another era sandwiched into our modern world. What does it mean, I still don't know. All I have are questions. Is Floor Zero aware of us, or are we just phantoms flickering in and out of their reality? Are there other elevators in other buildings that perform the same temporal magic? For now, Elevator D remains an unsolved mystery in a building otherwise dominated by logic and routine, a vertical time machine encased in steel, forcing us to confront the ephemeral nature of time itself, a silent reminder that the layers of the past are closer than we think hidden just beyond the doors that separate what is from what once was. In the heart of Michigan, where the dense woods serve as a living canvas of ever-changing foliage and elusive wildlife, locals often whisper tales of a creature known only as the Dogman. Half man, half wolf, 
It is a legend that strikes both curiosity and dread into the hearts of those who venture into the wilderness. As for me, a woman with a passion for the great outdoors and a healthy skepticism of local myths, I would soon find myself entangled in the fabric of this tale. Equipped with a trusty tent, camping gear, and my loyal German Shepherd Max, I set off for a weekend retreat in the Manistee National Forest. The drive was peaceful, the hum of the engine accompanied by the melodic serenade of birdsong filtering through the open windows. By late afternoon, I found the perfect spot, a clearing by a serene lake, hidden from the world by a curtain of trees and towering pines. After pitching my tent and building a campfire, I sat by the lake, losing myself in the reflections of the twilight sky on the water. Max, ever vigilant, stood by my side, his eyes scanning the surroundings, as if he sensed something that I couldn't. I laughed off his behavior, tossing a stick for him to fetch, and snapping some pictures with my camera. The first inkling that something was amiss came as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of indigo and obsidian. An eerie howl echoed through the trees, a sound that seemed neither fully animal nor human. Max growled low in his throat, his body tense, eyes fixed on the darkening woods. Unsettled but not yet afraid, I decided to retreat to the safety of my tent. With Max beside me, I zipped it, tucking myself into my sleeping bag while leaving my flashlight and pocket knight within arm's reach, just in case. In the dead of night, I was awakened by the sound of footsteps, slow, deliberate, and heavy. Max's low growl filled the tent as he bared his teeth, staring at the fabric walls as if he could see through it. My heart pounding, I grabbed my flashlight and pocket knife and unzipped the tent cautiously, my hands shaking with a mixture of cold and fear. What I saw in that moment will haunt me forever. Bathed in the pale light of my flashlight was a creature standing on two legs, its body covered in dark fur, its eyes glowing an unnatural yellow. It was the Dog Man, the living, breathing embodiment of Michigan's most unsettling legend. Our eyes met and a chill ran down my spine. It wasn't just the appearance of the creature that frightened me, it was the intelligence I saw in its eyes, a malevolent cunning that hinted at something far more terrifying than any wild animal. Before I could react, Max lunged at the creature, snapping and growling with a ferocity I'd never seen in him. The dog man let out a snarl of frustration, or perhaps surprise, and for a moment, just a moment, it seemed to reconsider. It was that momentary distraction that gave me the chance to act. I shouted loudly, my voice tinged with desperation, and hurled my pocket knife at the creature. Miraculously, it hit its mark, and the dog man let out a low howl of pain, or perhaps anger, retreating into the dark depths of the forest. I quickly grabbed Max, zipped up my tent, and sat there, trembling in the silence that followed, a silence that felt like the world holding its breath. When dawn finally broke, I packed up my camp as quickly as I could, leaving behind the tranquility of the lake for the harsh reality of the known world. I never reported my encounter, but I also never returned to those woods. The experience forever changed me, shattering my skepticism and leaving me with an unshakable respect for the stories and legends that shape our understanding of the wilderness. The Michigan woods are a place of beauty, but they are also a realm where myths walk on four legs, or sometimes two, and where the line between the natural and the supernatural is eternally blurred. I was sitting on the balcony, a cup of coffee in hand, watching the sun sink behind the city skyline. The buildings cast long shadows, 
their outlines turning to silhouettes against the fading light. It was a moment of stillness, one I had learned to treasure in a life otherwise filled with noise and haste. That's when it happened. Without warning, the sky began to deform. Towers bent at impossible angles, and skyscrapers folded over like they were made of paper. The city compressed in on itself, the whole panorama turning into a surreal, collapsing accordion. My coffee cup slipped from my hand, crashing onto the floor, but I hardly noticed. I was too fixated on the impossible sight before me. It was as if reality itself was being manipulated, the natural laws governing time and space summarily dismissed. Buildings that should have been miles apart were suddenly adjacent, then overlapping, then melding into a singular twisted mass. Roads, bridges, entire neighborhoods swallowed up, leaving behind an unrecognizable jumble of architecture and negative space. My heart raced, my mind struggling to process what my eyes were seeing. I gripped the railing, knuckles white, half expecting the balcony to fold into the nightmare landscape. But then, as quickly as it had started, the city snapped back to its original form. Skyscrapers untangled themselves, roads stretched back to their proper lengths, and everything returned to its normal state, as if nothing had happened. Except it had. I had seen it. The twisted shapes, the melding of structures, the complete disregard for the laws of physics. They were imprinted on my memory, a scar on my understanding of the world. I retreated inside, locking the sliding door behind me. My eyes darted around the room, half expecting the walls to start folding. But nothing happened. Everything was as it should be, or at least appeared to be. I grabbed my phone, texting friends, posting on social media, desperate to find someone else who had seen what I had. But no one responded with anything other than confusion or concern for my well-being. Days passed. I found myself unable to step back onto the balcony, fearful of what I might witness. I buried myself in work, in social commitments, in anything that could distract me from that unexplainable moment. But the city had other plans. It started with little things, street signs displaying gibberish, buildings appearing shorter or taller than they should be, the city map occasionally glitching out on my phone. Each occurrence was brief, easy to dismiss as a fluke or a trick of the light. Yet they kept happening, each anomaly chipping away at my sense of reality, reminding me that something was fundamentally wrong. And so I find myself here, writing this down both as a record and a warning. I don't know what caused the city to fold or why I was the only one to witness it. I don't know if it was a glitch in the fabric of reality or something more sinister. But I do know this. The skyline is not what it seems. It's a facade, a mask hiding something we're not meant to see. And now that I've glimpsed what's behind it, I can't shake the feeling that it's only a matter of time before the mask falls away completely. What happens then, I don't know. But as I sit here, staring out at the city that was once my home, I can't escape the terrifying thought that one day the skyline will fold again, and this time, it won't unfold. So I watch and wait, my eyes never straying too far from those towering silhouettes, wondering when they'll make their next move and what that move will mean for all of us who live in the shadow of their hidden instability. Until then, the skyline remains, a distorted reflection of a reality I no longer trust, but have no choice but to inhabit. The air had a sharp chill as I wandered through the dense forest of Belarus, not far from the village of my grandmother. I had often heard stories of the mischievous spirits and entities that lurked in these woods, but like most of the younger generation, I dismissed them as tales to keep children from wandering too far. The day had started sunny and cheerful, but as evening approached, an eerie fog settled, 
making visibility almost non-existent. Despite my logical mind, I felt a shiver of unease. The stories of my childhood echoed in my ears. The Zedka, forest spirits that could lead you astray or reward you, and the Pulevic, spirits of the fields that appeared at noon and sunset, sometimes harmful and sometimes benign. Walking slowly, my shoes crunched on the leaves, but then I heard a different sound, the soft, delicate laughter of a child. Thinking it was perhaps a villager's kid lost in the woods, I called out, Hello? The laughter continued, leading me farther and farther away from my known path. It seemed like hours had passed when I finally reached a clearing. There, in the middle of the clearing, stood a circle of ancient stones, each covered in moss. In the center of the circle, a young girl with pale, almost translucent skin and wearing a white dress danced, her laughter echoing around her. As she turned, her eyes met mine. They were an unnatural shade of green. She beckoned me forward. I felt a magnetic pull, but deep inside, a voice screamed for me to stay back. The girl seemed to embody both innocence and malevolence. I've been waiting for you, she whispered in a voice that seemed older than her appearance. Come dance with me. Entranced, I took a step forward, but suddenly a loud caw broke the spell. A raven landed on one of the stones, its eyes fixed on me. It cawed again, more urgently this time. The girl hissed, her face distorting into something less human, more sinister. Leave, she screamed at the bird, but the raven merely cawed louder, flapping its wings aggressively. Shaking my head, trying to clear the fog from my mind, I backed away from the circle. The girl's scream pierced the air as she began to vanish, her form dissolving into the mist. The raven, now calm, hopped down from the stone and transformed. Before me stood an elderly woman with silver hair, her voice lined with wisdom and age. She sighed deeply. Young one, you were almost ensnared by the Zedka. She tries to trap souls, making them dance for eternity. I am a guardian of these woods, and the ravens are my allies. You must be more careful and respect the spirits, both good and evil. Feeling shaken and overwhelmed, I nodded. Thank you, I whispered. She gave a gentle smile. Remember the tales of your ancestors. They hold truths and warnings. With that, she transformed back into a raven and flew away. I quickly made my way back to the village, my heart racing. The stories of my grandmother were not mere tales. They were rooted in the very soil of Belarus. And from that day on, I listened to those tales with newfound respect and awe. I work as a night guard at Alcatraz Island, the infamous former prison located in San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz has been many things, a military fortification, a military prison, and later a maximum security federal penitentiary. But for the last several decades, it has stood as a tourist attraction, a place where people can come and glimpse the darker aspects of human history. When you work the night shift at a place like Alcatraz, you encounter stories of hauntings, whispers of Al Capone playing his banjo in the shower room, or cries of prisoners long gone, still echoing in the cells. These stories didn't bother me much. I've never been the superstitious type, and years on the job made me familiar, almost comfortable with the island's grim ambiance. However, local folklore speaks of something else, a figure known as the Lone Wanderer. Unlike the hauntings that are confined to the cells and specific locations within the prison, 
This entity is said to wander around the island. The legend goes that he was a prisoner who loved the sea. During his sentence, he was a well-behaved inmate and earned the right to do some gardening as a daytime job. They say he was plotting an escape, intending to swim across the bay, but he was caught and thrown into solitary confinement where he passed away, never seeing the open ocean again. The lone wanderer, they say, still roams the island at night, searching for his lost chance at freedom. One evening, a thick fog rolled in over the Bay Area. The fog in San Francisco is different. It's thicker, almost palpable, like you could grab a handful if you tried. That night, I was doing my usual rounds, walking with my flashlight and radio. The tourists had long since departed, and it was just me and the echoes of my footsteps. I reached the gardens, the place where, according to legend, the lone wanderer used to work. I don't know if it was the fog or the solitude, but something felt off. The air was denser, and I had a peculiar feeling of being watched. That's when I heard it. Footsteps. Not my own, but another set, faint and inconsistent, as if hesitating. I shined my flashlight in the direction of the sound, but it revealed nothing. Unease crawled up my spine, but I convinced myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I continued my rounds until I reached the edge of the island that faced the open sea, where the fog was now so thick I could barely see a few feet in front of me. And that's when I saw him. A figure, indistinct but unmistakably human, standing at the edge, looking out toward the ocean. For a moment, I froze. My radio, my flashlight, they all seemed irrelevant. The figure stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was probably just a few seconds. And then, as quietly as he appeared, he walked away, dissipating into the fog. I stood there, my heart pounding, both terrified and fascinated. Was it the lone wanderer? I can't say for sure. What I do know is that I felt an unexplainable sense of sorrow, tinged with a freedom I have never felt before. A freedom that can only come when you're so close to achieving something you've yearned for, but are held back at the final moment. The next day I went through the security footage but found nothing. No signs of anyone walking the island. I have continued my nightly round since then, occasionally standing at the edge, looking out into the sea, contemplating the story of the Lone Wanderer. Even today when the fog rolls in and the atmosphere turns heavy, I can't help but feel a presence, an entity bound by longing and unfulfilled wishes. I haven't seen him again, but I often wonder, does he find solace in his eternal, solitary walks, or is he forever haunted by the sea he can never touch? The woods of Maine had always held a special place in my heart, ever since my family began vacationing there when I was a child. The tall pines, the craggy coastlines, and the deep sense of isolation made it the perfect escape from the pressure of everyday life. This year, I invited some friends, Mike, Sarah, and Liz, to join me on a camping trip, blissfully unaware that this particular venture would be unlike any other. We set up camp deep in the woods, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. Our campsite was idyllic, encircled by ancient trees and just a stone's throw away from a tranquil lake. We spent the day fishing, swimming, and basking in the beauty of our surroundings. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire roasting marshmallows and sharing stories. It was then that Mike, a Maine native, brought up the local legend of the Pokemoonshine Lake Monster, a serpent-like creature 
rumored to inhabit the depths of a lake not too far from where we were camping. It's supposed to be massive, he said, with scales like armor and eyes that glow in the dark. We all laughed it off, attributing the legend to the vivid imaginations of bored locals. But as the fire dimmed, we retreated to our tents and the atmosphere changed. The woods, which had felt so inviting during the day, now seemed to close in around us, as if hiding secrets in the shadows. It must have been around midnight when I first heard the noise, a low rumble, like something large moving through water. I unzipped my tent and peered out into the darkness, my eyes straining to adjust. There it was again, this time accompanied by a series of splashes and the sound of something heavy dragging itself along the ground. Curiosity getting the better of me, I woke up Mike and Sarah and together we grabbed our flashlights and cautiously made our way toward the lake. And there, in the water, illuminated only by the silvery glow of the moon, was an enormous serpent-like form, its scales glistening, and its eyes, two glowing orbs, fixated on us. In a state of collective shock, we scrambled back to our campsite, adrenaline coursing through our veins. Liz, roused by our hurried movements, stared at us in disbelief as we recounted what we'd seen. We need to stay in our tents until morning, Mike said, his voice tinged with a gravity I had never heard before from him. We huddled in our tents, too terrified to speak. That's when the scratching began. Slow, deliberate, and unnervingly close, like the sound of talons dragging along the canvas walls of our tents. The noise circled the campsites, stopping and starting, but always there, a maddening soundtrack to the longest night of our lives. As dawn broke, the scratching finally ceased, replaced by the familiar sounds of birdsong and rustling leaves. We emerged from our tents, visibly shaken but unharmed, our campsite untouched. Packing up as quickly as we could, we left that place, vowing never to return. And while we never spoke of that night again, the experience bonded us in a way nothing else could, a shared encounter with the unexplained, forever etched in our memories. Now, when I hear tales of cryptids or local legends, I no longer dismiss them as mere folklore, because in the remote woods of Maine, we came face to face with something that defied explanation, something that turned skeptics into believers and a casual camping trip into a haunting encounter with the unknown. My work as a geologist often took me to remote corners of Arizona, places where the roads stretch out into the horizon and the desert stretches out even further. A landscape that could be hypnotic in its repetitive beauty. But that day in September, the land felt different somehow, its eerie emptiness weighing heavily on me. I was returning from a soil testing job driving my well-worn pickup down a highway I'd traversed at least a dozen times before. Dusk was falling, casting long shadows on the ground and turning the sky into a canvas of reds and purples. I was listening to a podcast about ancient civilizations, their folklore and myths, which usually fascinated me. But on that drive, the words became a monotonous drone blending into the background as I struggled to keep my focus. Just when my eyes were becoming a little too heavy for comfort, I saw it, a solitary tree standing near the highway. 
This wouldn't be remarkable in any other circumstance, but this tree was ablaze. Flames leapt from its branches, yet it didn't seem to be burning down. It stood there, a spectacle of fire against the backdrop of the setting sun. I pulled over, grabbed my fire extinguisher, and ran toward it. But as I got closer, I realized something astonishing. There was no heat emanating from the flames. Cautiously, I extended a hand toward the fire and felt nothing but the cool desert air. The flames were cold, or at least not hot. My rational mind grappled with this impossibility. It was then that I heard the whisper, a hushed voice so soft it was almost drowned out by the crackling flames. Help me, it said. I looked around, thinking someone must be playing a trick on me, but there was no one. I was alone with this inexplicable burning tree. Who are you? I stammered, feeling ridiculous for talking to a tree, but unable to help myself. I am bound the voice whispered, more audibly this time. Release me. Without thinking, I pulled out the small hatchet I kept in my toolkit for sample collection. As the blade cut through the bark, the flames flickered, as if reacting to my touch. Finally, with one last swing, I severed a branch. The moment it fell, the flames vanished, leaving the tree as it was, just a tree. I felt a sudden rush of wind, and a feeling of liberation washed over me. The tree looked normal, mundane even, but I couldn't shake the sensation that something extraordinary had just occurred. I took the severed branch with me, storing it carefully in the back of my pickup. That night, I did some research and found local Native American legends about spirits being trapped in trees, waiting for someone to release them. Could it be that I had encountered one such spirit? Rational explanations eluded me, but the branch, still untouched by burn marks, was a tangible, physical proof that I clung to. Since then, my views on the paranormal have shifted. I don't know what I released that day or what it meant, but I do know that the desert is a place of mysteries, some better left unsolved others begging to be explored. Whatever it was, that fiery visage is etched in my memory, a constant reminder that reality is far more complex and wondrous than we can ever fully comprehend. I've always been an outdoorsy type, eager to explore every inch of the world's natural beauty. The Maine woods were no exception, and I'd ventured deep into them countless times. Every now and then, locals would talk about eerie occurrences, disappearances, strange cries at night, and even whispered legends of a creature known as the Rake, an almost skeletal humanoid entity with elongated limbs and lifeless eyes. I dismissed these tales as old wives' tales, but I would soon regret my skepticism. It was late July, and I was taking a solo trek through the forest to clear my mind. The canopy of green above me was a comforting sight, and the songs of birds echoed in the distance. I'd set up camp near a creek, enjoying the solitude and the symphony of water trickling over the rocks. As darkness fell, I prepared a fire and settled into my tent, my flashlight and Swiss army knife within arm's reach, just in case. The air was unusually dense that night, thick with a tension that draped over the forest like a dark veil. I shook off the feeling and slid into my sleeping bag, dismissing it as the product of an overactive imagination. In the dead of night, a rustling outside my tent yanked me from my sleep. My heart pounded as I grabbed my flashlight, 
unzipping the tent just enough to poke my head out. The beam of light danced through the trees, but found nothing. Slightly relieved, I told myself it was probably just a raccoon or a squirrel, but the tension in the air still held its grip on me. I tightened the zipper and returned to sleep. Not long after, I was awakened again, this time by an unholy screech that echoed through the woods. It was a sound that defied description, like the scream of a woman combined with the roar of an animal. I felt my blood freeze, my body paralyzed with fear. As quickly as I could, I put on my boots and grabbed my knife. With the flashlight in hand, I stepped outside the tent. The forest had fallen ominously silent. Even the creek seemed to murmur more quietly, as if aware of the dread that hung in the air. I began to move cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the dark. I told myself I would investigate only a little before turning back. Just when I thought I couldn't handle any more suspense, I saw it. A figure no more than 50 feet away was hunched over, drinking water from the creek. It was skeletal, but covered in patches of skin its elongated limbs disturbingly human, yet entirely wrong. I nearly dropped my flashlight when it turned toward me, revealing hollow eyes that seemed to absorb the light. In that moment, I felt a terror that eclipsed all rational thought. My legs carried me back to my tent faster than I'd ever moved. I tore it down in record time, throwing everything into my backpack. I didn't look back until I was well away from that clearing, and even then, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was still being watched. When I finally emerged from the forest, bathed in the first light of dawn, I knew something had changed in me. The woods would never again be a sanctuary. They were now a place where nightmares could step out of the shadows and into reality. I never reported my experience, knowing the ridicule and skepticism that would greet me. Even now, years later, I can't find a logical explanation for what I encountered that night. But one thing is certain. The cryptic legends of Maine's forests hold a truth far more terrifying than any tale. And whatever that creature was, it's still out there, lurking in the depths of the woods. And so, I tell you this story with a warning. Be wary of the forest's edge, for beyond it might lie horrors that defy understanding. I stared at my reflection sweat gathered on my brow. The reflection was grinning, fang-like teeth showing, but my own lips were pressed tight, a flat line of apprehension. It's just a mirror, just a glass and a bit of silver paint, I told myself, but I couldn't shake off the chill snaking up my spine. Glancing away, I tried to focus on the small, unimportant details around me, the chipped paint on the bathroom door, the slowly dripping faucet. Anything to get that sinister smile out of my head. Yet I felt its eyes, my eyes, still locked onto me. The room seemed to close in, walls breathing like they had lungs, squeezing the air out. I forced myself to look again. The grin was wider, and my reflection's eyes squinted, as if it were laughing at some secret joke. I needed to break the loop, and so I raised a trembling hand, expecting my reflection to mimic me. It didn't. That was it. I hurled my fist at the glass. The mirror shattered, pieces of my distorted image scattering onto the tile floor. For a moment, there was just silence, just my own labored breathing. Relief washed over me. Then I heard it. A whispering giggle 
echoing from the shards littering the ground. My eyes darted to each broken piece, and I saw that my reflection still wore the same haunting smile. Every single piece grinned back at me. I bolted out of the bathroom, tripping over the edge of a rug as I entered the hallway. My bare feet pounded on the hardwood floor as I sped toward the living room, heart racing like a drum roll. The house felt alien, each creak of wood and distant rustle of leaves outside taking on a menacing tone. I grabbed my phone from the coffee table. No way I was staying another second here. I dialed Connor's number, my closest neighbor, and a friend who lived down the road. But the voice that answered wasn't his. Having fun yet? It was my voice, tinged with that same mischievous tone. I threw the phone across the room. It smacked against the wall and dropped onto the couch. Enough was enough. I headed for the front door, grabbing my coat in a swift motion. The door creaked open and I stepped into the night. My feet had barely touched the gravel of the driveway when I froze. Every window in my house glowed with an unnatural light, and in each one I could see my reflection, grinning, laughing, watching me. I turned my back to it all, refusing to give those warped images another second of my attention. I walked down the empty road, moonlight casting long shadows on the pavement. In the distance, I heard a wolf howl, a lonely sound swallowed by the sprawling woods flanking either side of the road. When I finally reached Connor's house, I didn't bother knocking. I let myself in, locking the door behind me. He found me there, sitting on his living room floor, shaking. I told him everything. He listened, his face a canvas of concern and disbelief. Then he went silent, his eyes widening. He pointed behind me, his finger trembling. Jake, is that your coat hanging on the door? I turned. It was. My coat, the one I had grabbed on my way out. Except I was wearing my coat, wasn't I? A cold wave of realization swept over me. Don't turn around, Connor said his voice barely a whisper. But I did. I did turn. And there I was, grinning from the doorway, wearing the same coat, and fading into the dark hall behind me, as if pulled by unseen strings. Antarctica is not a place for the faint-hearted. It's a vast expanse where white and silence bleed into each other, rendering the landscape a blank canvas on which the mind can paint its deepest fears. As a research meteorologist stationed in McMurdo, I've braved conditions that would break a lesser soul. Howling winds, endless darkness, and temperatures that can freeze a man's spirit as easily as his flesh. But it's not the harshness of the climate that unnerves me. It's the whispers that come with the snowstorms. They're more than just auditory hallucinations. They've saved lives, including my own. You don't speak of them openly, those whispers. Antarctica has a way of humbling you, of making human words seem inadequate against its majestic and cruel indifference. But among the crew, we all know. When the snowstorms hit and the whispers come, you listen. It happened during a routine data collection mission. The sky had already turned an ominous gray, a storm brewing on the horizon, but we thought we'd have enough time. We thought wrong. Within minutes, visibility dropped to near zero, the snow a white haze that erased the distinction between earth and sky. The icy wind howled like a feral beast, gnawing through layers of thermal clothing. And then, through the cacophony, I heard it. A whisper so faint it could have been mistaken for a figment of my imagination. Left, it breathed, 
an ethereal wisp of sound snatched away by the gusts. My instincts screamed against it. Left would take us farther away from base, but something about that whisper felt different, like a thread of warmth woven into the frozen air. I looked at my fellow researcher, her eyes wide, her lips quivering with unspoken recognition. Did you hear it too? I mouthed. She nodded. Against reason, against logic, we veered left. The snow deepened each step an effort that seemed to drain years from our lives. The whisper persisted, guiding us through the storm as if an invisible hand was carving out a path for us to follow. Straight, it beckoned. Right, it urged, each direction accompanied by a growing sense of urgency. After what seemed an eternity, the tempest began to recede as if the elements had decided we'd earned our reprieve. Ahead of us, barely visible through the lifting mist, was the outline of an old supply cache. Forgotten by time but marked on no current map, it offered temporary refuge and, crucially, a radio. By the time we were rescued, the storm had unleashed its full fury on our original path. Had we not veered left when we did, we would have walked straight into an ice crevasse, an abyss hidden by the snow, our bodies forever entombed in Antarctic white. No one spoke of the whispers after that, but sometimes, in the middle of a snowstorm, when human voices are drowned by nature's roar, I'd catch Sarah's eye and see reflected there the inexplicable. It's as if Antarctica itself reached out to guide us through its icy maze, as if the very air we breathed bore messages from an unknown sender. Does it make me question the science I've dedicated my life to? The empirical reality I thought I knew? No, but it makes me wonder about the hidden dimensions of the world, the inexplicable phenomena that lie just beyond our understanding. In the realm of Antarctic white, where the line between life and death is as thin as the edge of a razor, those whispers are a reminder of our vulnerability, our insignificance in the grand scheme. Yet they're also a testament to the enduring mysteries of the world, unquantifiable threads that weave their way through the tapestry of human experience. And it's in that delicate balance between knowing and not knowing that I find my humility, my awe, and the endless fuel for the questions that drive us forward into the unknown. I had heard the stories about Il Dipinto Maledetto, the cursed painting, long before I decided to visit Sforza Castle in Milan. I was a freelance art historian with a penchant for the eerie and the strange. The castle, an imposing structure built in the 15th century, was the perfect blend of history and mystery. After maneuvering through the cobblestone streets of Milan, I finally found myself at the castle's grand entrance. Inside, the courtyards and towers sprawled in a labyrinthine layout, and the walls seemed to reverberate with the whispers of bygone eras. I had specifically come to see the art collections, especially the works of the Italian Renaissance. As I made my way through the castle's museums, an elderly guide named Signora Bianchi noticed my intense focus on the paintings. She approached and began a conversation. Ah, a connoisseur, she said, smiling. Would you like to see something unique? I was intrigued. Of course. Follow me, she said, leading me down a lesser known corridor. There is one painting that we rarely show to the public, for it has a strange tale attached to it. She paused in front of an unassuming wooden door. Unlocking it, she guided me into a dimly lit room where a single painting hung on the wall, veiled by a curtain. She drew the curtain aside. Behold, Il Dipinto Maladetto. 
The painting was hauntingly beautiful, depicting a young woman with melancholic eyes. Her gaze seemed to follow you, lending her an eerily lifelike quality. Signora Bianchi proceeded to tell me the local legend. The painting was created by an obscure artist who was infatuated with the woman depicted. However, she did not reciprocate his feelings and tragically passed away under mysterious circumstances. Brokenhearted and distraught, the artist is said to have imbued the painting with his soul, cursing it forever. It's believed the painting brings misfortune to anyone who stares into the eyes of the woman for too long, she warned. I chuckled, half amused and half skeptical. An intriguing story, to be sure. Ah, the skepticism of youth, she sighed. But beware, many have felt a strange melancholy after looking into her eyes, and some have even claimed to see the figure in their dreams. As I turned back to the painting, our eyes locked. For a fleeting moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of sorrow, as if her emotions were flowing into me. Shaking off the sensation, I thanked Signora Bianchi and left the room, attributing my feelings to the power of suggestion. That night, however, I was plagued by vivid dreams of the woman in the painting. She seemed to beckon me, her eyes filled with an unspeakable sadness. The next morning, I couldn't shake off the eerie experience. Whether it was the product of an overactive imagination or something more inexplicable, the cursed painting had etched its story onto my consciousness. I returned to the museum, not to debunk the tale, but to pay my respects to the artistry that could evoke such powerful emotions. As I stood before Il Dipinto Maledetto one final time, I felt humbled by the realization that some stories, whether folklore or fact, are destined to remain a mystery. And in that gray area between skepticism and belief, I found an uncanny form of beauty that defied simple explanations. Sforza Castle continued to be a symbol of Milan's rich history, but for me it became a place where art and legend coalesced into a compelling, haunting narrative, one that I would carry with me long after I left the castle's ancient walls. This incident occurred to my boyfriend and I roughly two years ago, deep into the night. I felt compelled to share this story as it has left an indelible mark on me and plagues me with nightmares to this very day. It was a September night around two o'clock in the morning. We live about 25 minutes outside a town in northern British Columbia, with our house nestled in the woods. Due to the seclusion of our road, we would typically pull out of our driveway before turning on our car lights, a quirky habit we both shared. After this night, however, our lights go on instantly. On this particular night, I was driving. As I made a left out of our driveway and switched on the high beams, we saw it. A strange, hairless, pale humanoid entity was crouched in the middle of the road. It almost appeared luminescent, but that might have been due to its extreme paleness reflecting the high beams. It sharply turned its head toward us, seemingly startled by our sudden illumination. In a matter of seconds, this being awkwardly moved across the road with disjointed motions, finally descending into the three-foot-deep ditch. But that wasn't the end of it. From the ditch, it turned to face us, standing upright on its hind legs. Its stance was eerily similar to a human, yet off. Considering the depth of the ditch, the creature loomed more than five feet above it, making it taller than our vehicle and putting its height at well over seven feet. It adopted an aggressive posture, shoulders hunched, leaning slightly forward, peering intently at our car. And in that moment, I felt it. 
it wasn't just looking at our car. It was gazing intently through the window, directly at me. Its gaze conveyed an unsettling intelligence, as though it knew that we were the ones controlling the vehicle. Matching its pace with our car's crawl, I maintained eye contact, watching it twist its neck to keep its gaze locked onto me even as we passed. Once it was out of sight, I refocused on the road ahead. Silence filled the car. We both processed the encounter in solitude, in our own minds, silent, driving under 10 kilometers per hour. I seldom recount this story, as many either scoff at it or attempt to rationalize it as a malnourished albino bear or things like that. Fast forward to a year later. Just before winter, his parents, who own a dog, came for a visit. One evening, at dusk, his mother and I were enjoying a smoke on our six-foot-high deck. It's positioned on the same side as the road leading to town, giving us a vantage point to the patch of woods where the prior encounter took place. Suddenly, the sound of snapping twigs resonated, coinciding with the dog's frantic barking. Despite his small stature, the dog appeared ready to leap off of the deck and chase something into the woods. He didn't, and the dog is fine. Just as my boyfriend emerged from the house, amidst the trees we caught a fleeting glimpse of a tall, slender, white figure. Its definitive features were obscured, and given his mother's poor eyesight and her missing glasses, she didn't see much but a gut-wrenching sensation told me that it was the same entity. I chose to share this experience, hoping for understanding and perhaps belief from those in this community. Now, we avoid venturing outside after dark. Strangely, a part of me yearns to see it again. Before this incident, I had read similar stories with a sense of detached fascination, but actually locking eyes with such an entity the awe and terror were unparalleled. I often ponder this experience. It is so deeply etched into my memory that even the mere thought can evoke tears of fear. I hope someone else finds this story as compelling as I do. from Northern British Columbia, Canada. A few years ago, my friend invited me to join him, his mother, and sister at a resort beside a lake roughly 90 minutes from our town. This trip occurred at the cusp of June and July. Now, I term it a resort because while it has a primary log building, which functions as both a check-in spot and a restaurant, it's mostly just a collection of log cabins with spaces near the lake for RVs. So, resort is in very heavy air quotes. The location is predominantly surrounded by expansive forests, with the only real disruption being the highway that slices through the woods. Despite a few scattered houses around the lake, it's generally a quiet area, unless it's a holiday weekend. A winding road connects the cabins to the main building, which is a brief five to eight minute walk. Beyond the main structure, there is a clearing with tables, seemingly untouched for a decade given the overgrown vegetation around them. A short distance from these tables, within the woods, lie two lagoons encircled by an old wire fence. We arrived in the evening familiarized ourselves with our cozy log cabin and began exploring. The first day was fairly uneventful, but the next day's overcast and rainy weather was surprisingly welcome. It ensured fewer visitors, granting us more freedom. Our explorations led us to the clearing with the old tables, which clearly hadn't been used in ages given the encroaching nature. Delving further, about 50 feet into the woods, we discovered the lagoons. 
An intriguing detail was a section of the wire fence, flattened as if a large animal had passed over it. We nonchalantly dismissed it and continued our exploration, intending to return later. However, our next visit was cut short by strange noises, reminiscent of footsteps from the previous day's path. This experience kept us on edge, but we rationalized that it might just be the local wildlife. Despite the unsettling atmosphere, we even ventured to another forested spot near the cabins, where, oddly enough, we heard echoes of our own actions. It was like somebody mimicking our branch-breaking sounds. This was even more unsettling when we realized the unlikelihood of another person being in that same remote spot. Later that evening, our attempts to recreate the sounds were interrupted by a strange and frightening sight, a shadowy figure hiding behind a tree. Panic took over and we fled back to our cabin. That night's discussion was more sober as we tried to make sense of the figure and the sounds. Fast forward a year and we were back, this time with an additional friend. We briefed him about our prior adventures, which he met with skepticism. Yet the ensuing days made a believer out of him. Our encounters this time were mostly around the lagoon area. We again heard the footsteps, and on our last day, a terrifying, indescribable screech. Investigating, we were met with a sudden, massive sound of something heavy hitting the ground. We fled in terror only to later encounter a black bear, which, to our astonishment, seemed just as afraid and bolted away. It wasn't afraid of us, either. It was running from the direction where we had just had our encounter. It barely even looked at us. As I contemplate revisiting this year, I recount this story to seek insights. Two distinct entities seem to reside there, the elusive woodsman or tree knocker, and the aggressive entity that we have dubbed the Screecher. Despite scouring the internet, I have found no similar experiences. Does anybody have insights or theories about these mysterious presences? The location, despite its oddities, is genuinely picturesque and offers great amenities. It's known as a Purden Lake Resort, with a notable green roof. Anyway, I welcome any theories about what might be lurking there. I had always considered myself a rational person, until I spent a semester studying in Coyoacan, Mexico City. A neighborhood steeped in history and culture, Coyoacan had been the stage for many significant events, including the lives of Diego Rivera and Frido Kahlo. Yet it wasn't the artistic heritage that captivated me. It was the local legend of Los Monmullos, the Whispering Walls. The tale goes like this. Many years ago, a powerful alchemist was rumored to have lived in a secluded mansion in Coyoacan. His name has been forgotten, but locals claim that his spirit still resides within the walls of a particular house near the Plaza Hidalgo. These walls, they say, whisper secrets and prophecies to those who dare listen. Intrigued by the myth, I decided to delve deeper. It didn't take long to identify the mansion in question, an imposing yet dilapidated structure that was currently serving as an antique store. The owner, Senora Martinez, was a kind elderly woman who had heard the whispers herself. But you must visit at dusk, she warned. That's when the walls are most talkative. Armed with curiosity and a dash of skepticism, I returned to the mansion later that evening. The sun had just dipped below the horizon casting long shadows across the cobblestone streets. As I entered the building, a sudden shiver ran down my spine. The atmosphere felt dense, almost as if it were charged with static electricity. 
Following Senora Martinez's instructions, I approached the oldest part of the mansion, a small chamber filled with dusty books and ancient artifacts. There, I stood silently, my ears straining to catch any sound. At first, there was nothing. Then, gradually, I began to hear a soft murmur. It was almost as if the walls themselves were whispering in hushed tones. I couldn't make out distinct words, but the timber of the voices struck me. They carried an unexplainable weight, like a sorrowful lament or a prayer. Just then, a stronger voice broke through, clear and resonant. Ayuda, it said. Help. My heart pounded as I looked around, but the room was empty. It was unmistakably the wall that had spoken. In the following days, I couldn't shake the encounter from my mind. Consumed by the need to understand, I began researching more about the alchemist and the history of the mansion. To my surprise, I stumbled upon old documents, revealing that the alchemist had been a benevolent man, providing remedies to the sick during a plague that had swept through Cuyoacan. He had died under mysterious circumstances, and many believed that he had been betrayed by a close friend. Emboldened by this knowledge, I returned to the mansion. This time, the whispers seemed to acknowledge my presence, their murmurs turning into what sounded like a soft, appreciative sigh. As I left, I felt an overwhelming sense of peace, as if a weight had been lifted from the room. That encounter forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that some mysteries are beyond rational explanation. The whispering walls of Coyoacan became a long-lasting mystery to me, a whispered legend that I was fortunate enough to hear, adding another layer to the rich background of local folklore. And so, every time I pass by that ancient mansion, I offer a nod of respect. After all, who am I to argue with the walls that speak, in a city where the boundary between legend and reality often blurs, leaving only awe in its wake? In the labyrinth of cubicles, the clatter of keyboards and the murmur of voices had always been comforting white noise. But when I stepped into the office that Monday morning, the sounds twisted into something unintelligible, alien. People were talking, laughing, engaging in what seemed like ordinary conversations. But the words were wrong. The language wasn't one I recognized. Each syllable an alien vibration that set my nerves on edge. I tried to brush it off, to chalk it up to some elaborate prank or perhaps a transient glitch in my auditory perception. But the feeling of dislocation grew with each interaction. Morning, Marco, my coworker Carol greeted. But her words emerged as an indecipherable string of sounds. Her face was friendly, her tone congenial. But her language was foreign, a melodic yet incomprehensible sequence of notes. I nodded, muttered a generic greeting in response, and hurried to my desk. Maybe if I immersed myself in the routine, emails, spreadsheets, reports, the strangeness would dissipate, replaced by the comfortable monotony of office life. But the anomalies persisted. Emails read like cryptic puzzles, their characters a jumble of unfamiliar symbols. Even software interfaces had morphed, their commands inscrutable. My little island of a cubicle felt like an outpost in an alien landscape. Desperation set in. I picked up my phone and dialed my wife, seeking the anchor of a familiar voice. But when she answered, her words were as foreign as everyone else's, a garbled melody devoid of meaning. Panic surged, a tidal wave that threatened to pull me under. I bolted from my chair and made my way to the office exit. But outside, the city had transformed into an even more disorienting tableau. Billboards, street signs, even the text scrolling across the side of passing news vans. Everything was in that incomprehensible language. 
It was as if the very fabric of my reality had been reprogrammed, leaving me an outsider in my own world. Days turned into weeks. Linguists were baffled. Neurologists found no abnormalities. Even as I yearned for answers, I grew to dread them. What if this was irreversible? What if I was stuck in this incomprehensible reality, cut off from everyone I loved, from everything I understood? I started to carry a notebook, jotting down snippets of conversations, fragments of written text. I pored over them every night, a lone cryptographer trying to decode a cosmic enigma. Each word was a clue, each sentence a piece of an intricate puzzle that, when solved, might grant me passage back to my old life. And as I sifted through the fragments, a pattern emerged, echoes of my own language hidden within the chaos. Like a distorted reflection, the alien tongue seemed to mimic the structures, the rhythms, the underlying logic of my own, as if it were an imperfect translation of my world into another, a reality almost identical, but fundamentally skewed. It was an epiphany, a sliver of understanding that suggested an unsettling possibility. Had my reality been replaced? Or had it simply been altered? And if so, by what? By whom? As I delved deeper into this dissonant reality, the boundaries began to blur. I found myself understanding snippets of conversations, grasping the meaning behind the written symbols. It was as if I were tuning in to previously inaccessible frequency, my senses adapting to this altered world. But adaptation came at a cost. With each new word I deciphered, a corresponding piece of my old language seemed to fade away, as if I were trading one reality for another, unable to retain both. As the days turned into months, I was left to wonder, what happens when the last remnants of my old reality are gone? when I have fully adapted to this new world? Will I even remember what I've lost, or will I simply become a native of this foreign reality, ignorant of the man I used to be? I don't have the answers. All I have are questions, and a growing sense that I'm caught in a tide of transformation that's far from over. And as the alien syllables become increasingly familiar, as the foreign text begins to read like my native tongue, I'm left to ponder the nature of my new reality, and to fear what it might become. When I first toured the apartment, I was immediately drawn to its spacious rooms, high ceilings, and large windows that let in an abundance of natural light. However, there was one peculiarity, a locked door in the hallway. The landlord, a middle-aged man with a somewhat nervous demeanor, quickly brushed off my inquiries about it, saying it was just an old storage room, nothing to be concerned about. I moved in, excited to start this new chapter in my life. The first few days were uneventful, filled with unpacking and decorating. But then the noises began. Every night, precisely at midnight, I'd hear it. Soft, persistent scratching coming from behind the locked door. It started as a faint sound, almost like the scurrying of a mouse. But as days turned into weeks, it grew louder, more desperate. Curiosity and unease growing, I approached my landlord again, pressing him for more information about the room. He hesitated, then finally relented, sharing a story that had become something of an urban legend in the building. Years ago, the apartment had been occupied by a reclusive artist. He was rarely seen, always engrossed in his work. Rumors swirled about his obsession with a particular piece, a project he kept hidden in that very room. One day, he disappeared without a trace, leaving behind all his belongings. The only sign of his presence was the locked room, from which strange noises could be heard. The landlord admitted that no one had been able to open the door since, and over time it was simply accepted as a quirk of the building. Determined to uncover the truth, 
I decided to take matters into my own hands. With the help of a locksmith, the door was finally opened, revealing a dimly lit room covered in a thick layer of dust. The walls were adorned with various paintings, each more haunting than the last, but the centerpiece was a large canvas in the middle of the room. It depicted a dark, shadowy figure, its form almost human, but with elongated limbs and sharp, claw-like fingers. The background was a chaotic blend of colors, giving the impression of movement and turmoil. As I stared at the painting, a chilling realization washed over me. The scratching noises, the desperate sounds. It was as if the figure was trying to escape the confines of the canvas. Wanting to rid my home of this eerie presence, I contacted an art historian, hoping to gain insight into the painting's origins. She was fascinated by the piece, noting its unique style and the palpable energy it exuded. After extensive research, she discovered that the artist had dabbled in the dark side of the occult, using his work as a medium to channel and trap restless spirits. The shadowy figure in the painting was believed to be one such entity, bound to the canvas by the artist's dark rituals. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I sought the help of a spiritual expert. He performed a cleansing ritual, releasing the trapped spirit from the painting and ensuring it could no longer harm anyone. The painting was safely stored away, and the room was sealed once more. The nightly scratching ceased, and a sense of peace returned to the apartment. The experience served as a reminder of the power of art and the thin line that separates our world from the unknown. It taught me that some doors, both literal and metaphorical, are best left unopened, and that behind every locked door lies a story waiting to be told. You ever wake up with a sense of wrongness? I'm talking about that tingle at the base of your spine, a ghostly finger tracing the vertebrae. The day I found the crop circles in my field, that's exactly how I felt. Morning sun, already blistering, beat down on my face as I opened the front door. Coffee in hand, I surveyed the land. It's wheat season, golden stalks ready for harvest stretched toward the horizon. Yet there was a flaw in this otherwise perfect tableau. Patterns in the field caught my eye. Precise geometric circles pressed into the wheat, like a godly thumbprint in the soil. I ran back inside, grabbing my drone from the den. It was an old model, but functional. Within minutes, the drone hovered above the field, sending back video footage. I stared at my tablet screen, disbelieving. Complex and intricate designs sprawled across the field, almost like Mayan or Aztec glyphs. Perfect circles connected by lines, like constellations, with tangential shapes that seemed almost mathematical. This wasn't the work of bored teenagers. The designs were too elaborate, too precise, I decided to take a closer look. Climbing into my pickup, I drove along the dirt road parallel to the field. Up close, the circles were even more baffling. The stalks were bent, not broken, leaning at acute angles to form the patterns. No human footprint, no tire track, nothing to indicate how these formations came to be. Throughout the day, neighbors and even folks from town showed up. Speculations abounded, ranging from pranksters with boards and ropes to weird weather phenomena. Old man Gary from the next farm over muttered about ley lines and energy vortices, which nobody took seriously. As night approached, a deep unease settled over me. That sense of wrongness from the morning, it was now an itch I couldn't scratch. Something compelled me to stay up, to keep a vigil over the field. With the coffee pot at my side, I parked my pickup at the edge of the field, 
Headlights dimmed, engine off. Hours crawled by. The night was unsettlingly silent. Even the crickets hesitated to break the stillness. The sky was overcast, stars and moon hidden behind a shroud of clouds. Just past midnight, the unnatural silence was shattered by a low hum, vibrating the very air around me. I peered into the gloom. There, emerging from the cloudy sky, was a series of lights, softly glowing orbs descending toward the field. They moved in synchronized fluidity, like schools of fish in water, only this was midair. I dared not move, dared not even breathe loudly. The orbs hovered over the crop circles, casting eerie lights over the geometric designs. The low hum escalated into a pulsating rhythm, and I felt it in my bones, a resonating frequency that clashed with the core of my being. Then, as abruptly as they appeared, the orbs ascended, disappearing into the cloud cover. In the aftermath, I felt a lingering sense of violation, as if the land itself had been desecrated. I returned home, drained and weary. Sleep was elusive that night, and when it finally came, it was filled with restless dreams of labyrinthine patterns and unending voids. Morning light offered no solace. The circles remained, unchanged, untouched since yesterday's discovery. No one had seen the orbs but me, and I knew better than to talk about it. Sometimes ignorance is a comfort you offer to others, a protective barrier against the incomprehensible. But deep down, I knew that whatever created those circles, whatever those orbs were, was beyond our understanding, and it had left its mark upon the land. A webcam isn't the most sophisticated piece of technology for capturing celestial phenomena, but sometimes low-tech is all you have. It was my only option for monitoring the sky while working a tedious security job at a remote power plant. Mostly, the webcam caught passing clouds, birds, or the occasional plane. Not groundbreaking stuff, but it broke the monotony. But one night, something was off. I felt it before I saw it, like static in the air, a heightened sense of tension I couldn't shake. It prickled the back of my neck as I stared at the computer screen, the live feed displaying an inky sky punctuated by stars. And then they appeared, objects, fast, erratic, and too numerous to count, darting across the sky. Blink and you'd miss them, but once you noticed, you couldn't unsee them. They were dubbed fast walkers in the amateur astronomy community, but these were faster and smaller than any description I had ever read. My breath caught as I immediately hit the button to record the feed. The fast walkers continued their chaotic dance, spiraling, zigzagging, defying the laws of physics and aerodynamics. Too fast for birds, too erratic for any known aircraft. As I squinted into the screen, they seemed to pulse, as if emitting some sort of energy or light. When it was over, the sky returned to its dormant state, an empty stage after the performers had taken their final bow. I sat there, pulse still racing, cursor hovering over the saved file. Could it be a glitch? A camera malfunction? Deep down, I knew it wasn't. The footage was transferred onto a thumb drive, then uploaded into every cloud account I owned. It needed to be shared, analyzed, scrutinized. There was something that shattered the status quo, a glitch in the matrix of our everyday reality. I didn't sleep that night. How could I? I replayed the footage over and over, each viewing deepening my sense of awe and dread. This was beyond me beyond any conventional explanation. I needed to know more. Expert opinions varied, 
from dismissive scorn to hushed incredulity. Frame by frame, analysis showed no editing, no tampering. The fast walkers remained an enigma, data points that didn't fit into any existing models. And as the footage made its way through forums, YouTube channels, and even into the databases of researchers willing to venture outside the mainstream, I became an unwitting ambassador to a mystery that defied explanation. As weeks turned into months, the chatter faded. More pressing news, more immediate concerns, overshadowed my celestial mystery. Yet my footage remained, stored, archived, waiting for the day when it could be slotted into a narrative that made sense. Life resumed its normalcy. The power plant hummed along. My shifts continued in their repetitive cycle, but I wasn't the same. Every night I watched the sky, webcam forever recording, half in anticipation, half in dread of another visit. I became a familiar face in online forums dedicated to the unexplained. My story became one of many, remarkable but not unique in a world brimming with inexplicable phenomena. I found a strange comfort in this community of seekers, each with their own tale, each touched by the same elusive mystery. The sky above me remains a canvas of potential, a window into an unknown realm. But even as the questions linger, unanswered, I can't escape the conviction that what I captured that night wasn't random. It was a brief, frenetic intersection of two realities, ours and something else. Something that flits at the edge of perception, that darts through the gaps in our understanding, as elusive as it is undeniable. As I stare at my screen tonight, the sky empty yet full of stars, I find myself straddling two worlds, the one I live in and the one I glimpse in stolen, breathtaking moments. And as I reach out to adjust the focus on my humble webcam, I can't shake the feeling that somewhere in a distant, unknown expanse, I'm being watched in return. I was home alone, sitting on the couch watching TV, when I heard the front door suddenly click and lock on its own. Startled, I immediately got up to investigate. When I tried the doorknob, it was firmly locked, even though I knew I hadn't touched it. I distinctly remembered leaving it unlocked when I had let the dog out earlier. My pulse quickened as I considered the possibilities. Had the wind blown it shut? Was there an intruder in the house who had locked it for some reason? I cautiously checked each room, but found nothing amiss. Just to be safe, I also checked the windows to see if any were unlocked, but everything seemed secure. Returning to the front door, I examined the lock closely. There were no signs of tampering or a draft that could have blown it closed. The deadbolt required a key from both sides, so there was no way it could have locked itself accidentally. I tried the spare key, and sure enough, the door unlocked. Uneasy and perplexed, I double-checked that every window and door was locked before retreating back inside. I couldn't figure out how that front door had mysteriously locked itself while I was sitting just a room away. It was an unnerving experience, making me feel like I wasn't alone, where I was being watched. I still have no rational explanation for how it happened. All I know is that the seemingly self-locking door rattled my nerves and made me look over my shoulder for weeks after. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling, but I couldn't get the incident out of my mind. The rest of the night, I found myself double-checking the front door lock every time I walked by. I also couldn't stop thinking about the layout of the house and where someone could potentially hide or access a locked door. I kept peering around corners and listening for any unusual sounds. Later, as I was getting ready for bed, I thought I heard footsteps upstairs. I froze, straining to hear where they were coming from. Gripping a baseball bat, 
I slowly made my way upstairs, only to find nothing there. My imagination was simply getting the best of me, still spooked from the mystery of the locked door. Exhausted, but still vigilant, I corralled the dog into my bedroom and locked the door. I tucked the bat under my bed within arm's reach, should I need to defend myself in the night. As I lay there in the dark, I kept replaying the sound of the front door locking in my mind. How could it have locked itself so seamlessly without any drafts or interference? The spare key proved it had been the actual deadbolt mechanism turning, not just the latch. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I suddenly jolted awake. I thought I heard the upstairs floorboards creaking as if somebody was walking around. The dog was also sitting up in alert. My heart pounded as I lay frozen, listening intently. After what felt like an eternity, the creaking stopped. Exhaustion finally overtook me again and I fell into a troubled sleep. The next morning, I checked the entire house once more, but nothing was disturbed. I even had my brother come take a look at the front door to see if it had malfunctioned, but he insisted that all the hardware was working normally. But I still can't shake the ominous feeling that came over me that night. Something strange happened that I still can't explain, and I feel like I'm still being watched in my own home. I now know locks and bats provide only an illusion of safety against the unexplainable. I've always been fascinated by abandoned places. There's something haunting about remnants of lives once lived, crumbling back into nature. Last summer, while scouring satellite maps online, I discovered what looked like an overgrown plantation estate, deep in the rural county where I live. The curiosity was too much. I had to explore it. On a humid June day, I drove out following the GPS coordinates until I reached a seldom used dirt road snaking back into the dense forest. After a bumpy mile, I caught sight of a stone pillar framed by oak trees at the end of an overgrown driveway. This had to be the place. I parked and walked up the crumbling drive to find myself before the decaying facade of a once stately plantation home, two stories tall with white columns out front. The windows stared back like gaping eye sockets, frames drooping with rot. I strolled around to the side porch, its roof sagging under the weight of vines and kutsu. The back gardens were an impenetrable sea of weeds and brambles. Clearly, no one had lived here in decades. What stories lingered within these dead walls? I was itching to get inside and find out. Testing the front door, I found it unlocked. Hinges screeched as I eased it open just enough to slip through into the dusty foyer. Flecks of peeling wallpaper and plaster crunched under my footsteps. A musty odor hung in the air. I wandered slowly through the vacant rooms. Peeling floral wallpaper revealed the lathe beneath in places. Old furniture lay strewn about, drawers hanging open dollies and books scattered across the floor. In what was once a grand parlor, the marble fireplace had collapsed, its elaborate mantle cracked completely in two. Moving upstairs, I paused in a child's room. Shelves still held scattered wooden toys, headless dolls, a faded pink blanket spilling from an iron bed frame. What long ago little girl had once played here, I wondered. What tragedy befell this family, leaving their home stranded in time? A sudden loud thump from below made me jump. Just the old house settling, I told myself. Yet somehow it sounded almost purposeful. A minute later, another heavy thud seemed to come from the walls. Unease trickled down my spine. Maybe I should leave. 
Heading downstairs, I felt watched from every crevice and dark corner. I quickened my pace through the musty rooms. Turning a corner, I halted in shock. A tall, thin figure stood silhouetted in a doorway up ahead, dusty sunlight streaming behind. Heart racing, I stumbled back around the corner and pressed myself against the wall, willing my panicked breaths to quiet. When I dared to peer around again seconds later, the hallway stood empty. The back of my neck prickled as I looked around wildly. Where could someone have possibly gone so quickly and without a sound? A loud crash came from upstairs as if a door had been flung violently open. That was enough for me. I bolted outside, not stopping even after I reached my car. Tires spit gravel as I tore down the winding dirt driveway, every glance in the rearview mirror half expecting to see a pallid face watching from the gloom within those dead halls. But as time passed, my unease faded. I told myself it was all in my head, a trick of the light and shadows, but I don't think I believe that. I'll never return to explore the rest of that estate's tragic secrets. What my eyes imagined seeing there, if they did, was enough to haunt my dreams for years to come. Some doors to the past are better left unopened, mysteries unraveled. Whatever spirits still linger behind in that forgotten place, I'll let them keep their solitude undisturbed. The Airbnb was a quaint little cottage tucked away in the rural backroads, the kind of place that promised a reprieve from the clamor of city life. The reviews were stellar, the pictures inviting. When Emma and I arrived, it was even more charming in person, a cozy living room, antique furniture, and an atmosphere thick with rustic allure. We were about to congratulate ourselves on finding this hidden gem when Emma, made an observation. Hey, have you noticed something off about the mirrors? I looked around. She was right. Each mirror in the cottage was either covered with cloth or turned to face the wall. It wasn't just one or two. It was all of them, from the bathroom to the bedroom to even a small hand mirror that we found in a drawer. That's a bit weird, I admitted feeling a pinch of unease. Emma pulled out her phone. Maybe it's a cultural thing or some rural superstition? Should we ask the host? Before she could dial, I suggested, eh, let's not make a big deal out of it. People have their quirks, especially out here. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't entirely convinced. Nevertheless, we pushed the mirror issue to the back of our minds and focused on enjoying the evening. We made dinner, watched a movie on my laptop, and eventually retreated to the bedroom. The cottage had no Wi-Fi and spotty cell reception, isolating us from the world outside. It should have been freeing, but as the night deepened, the absence of mirrors started to take on a weight, invisible yet increasingly palpable. We crawled into bed and I turned off the lights. In the dark, the mirror issue resurfaced in my mind now a gnawing concern. The room was pitch black, save for the sliver of moonlight that sneaked through the curtains, casting elongated shadows on the walls. Then I heard it, a faint, almost indiscernible scratching sound, like fingernails against wood, coming from the direction of the covered mirror. I shot a glance at Emma, her eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. You heard that too? She whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice trembling despite myself. The scratching sound continued, rhythmically persistent. I weighed the options in my head, ignore it and hope it goes away, or confront it and risk discovering something we'd rather not know. A cloud must have moved because the room darkened even further, amplifying the tension. 
enough was enough. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprang out of bed and flipped on the light switch. The scratching stopped instantly. My eyes darted to the mirror covered with an embroidered cloth. I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I approached it, my hands shaking as I reached for the cloth. Wait, Emma said, her voice tinged with apprehension. I paused, locking eyes with her. In that moment, we both understood the risks of unveiling the unknown. I let my hand drop, stepping back. We should leave it alone, she said, a mixture of relief and lingering curiosity in her eyes. Agreed, I replied, unable to mask my own relief. We spent the rest of the night in a tense, sleepless vigil, the covered mirror a silent sentinel in the room. Morning couldn't come soon enough. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the curtains, we packed up and left without looking back. Our host sent us a message later, asking how our stay was. I hesitated before typing out a non-committal reply about the cottage being lovely and quaint. There was no mention of mirrors. The experience remained a puzzle piece that refused to fit, an anomaly in an otherwise idyllic getaway. The questions hovered in our minds but neither of us wanted to probe further. Some mysteries, we concluded, are better left covered. Their truths turned away to face the wall. The forests of Maine have always been a sanctuary for me, a place where I can lose myself in the serenity of towering trees and hidden lakes. But during a late summer camping trip in one of the state's more secluded forests, that sanctuary would become the setting for an experience so bizarre it shook the very foundations of what I thought I knew about the natural world. After a day spent hiking and fishing, I settled into my campsite as night began to fall. The air was thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, and the only sounds were the gentle rustle of leaves and the distant hooting of an owl. As I sat by my campfire, engrossed in a book, I felt a sudden change in the atmosphere, a subtle but palpable shift that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. That's when I heard it a low, almost guttural growl emanating from the woods beyond the circle of firelight. I snapped my head up, scanning the darkness that surrounded me, but saw nothing. Still, the feeling of being watched, of not being alone, continued to grow. Clutching my flashlight, I decided to investigate. Guided only by the narrow beam of light, and my mounting trepidation, I moved cautiously through the trees, my senses heightened, my footsteps muffled on the forest floor. Then I saw them, eyes, two glowing orbs floating just above ground level, staring directly at me. My heart pounded as I aimed the flashlight at them, revealing a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. Covered in dark, mottled fur, it was hunched over, its long, sinewy arms almost touching the ground. But it was the creature's face that captivated me, a haunting blend of human and animal features with an almost sorrowful expression. As our eyes met, the creature let out a soft, mournful cry, a sound that echoed through the woods and seemed to reverberate within me. Suddenly, as if startled by its own vulnerability, the creature swiftly turned and disappeared into the forest, its form blending seamlessly into the darkness, leaving me alone with my shock and disbelief. I returned to my campsite, my mind racing. Had I just encountered a cryptid? One of those mythical creatures that exist on the fringes of science and folklore? My thoughts turned to local legends of the Turner Beast, 
a mysterious creature said to roam the main woods, and I wondered if what I had seen was connected to these tales. Sleep did not come easily that night, and when dawn broke, I packed up and left, driven not by fear, but by an overwhelming sense of awe and wonder. As I made my way back to civilization, I felt a profound shift in my understanding of the world, a newfound respect for the mysteries that still linger in the hidden corners of our planet. I've returned to those woods several times since that night, always with a sense of anticipation and reverence, hoping for another glimpse of the unknown. And while I have yet to encounter the creature again, the experience remains etched in my memory, a constant reminder that in the depths of the main forests, something extraordinary waits, existing in the space between legend and reality. It was meant to be a celebration. My buddies and I were camping along the Black River to commemorate graduating high school. We'd been planning this trip for weeks, ever since the invitation to a night of beer and bonfires deep in the forest came from Jake's older brother. He knew the area well from fishing trips. That first night went perfectly, drinking and joking around a crackling fire under more stars than I'd ever seen. Sometime after midnight, I wandered away from the group to take a leak. As I was zipping up, something in the river caught my eye. A dark, massive shape cruising slowly against the current. I stared, puzzlement turning to unease. It was no overturned log or debris. This shape had a defined head and body, with what looked like several limb-like appendages trailing behind. As the moon briefly illuminated its surface, I glimpsed something scaly and slick, something very much alive. I hustled back to the fire, trying to convince myself it was just an odd shadow, but a nagging dread lingered at the back of my mind. I didn't mention what I'd seen to the others. They were pretty hammered and would have just laughed it off. Eventually, I passed out in my tent. Sometime before dawn, I woke to urgent whispers right outside the tent flap. It was Jake and some others, crouched in a circle. What's up? I asked groggily, crawling out to join them. Jake shone his flashlight toward the tree line. Huge claw marks gouged deep into the bark of several trees, sap still oozing. The gashes were far taller than any animal native to these woods could make. What the hell did this? Jake breathed. I slowly told them about the dark shape I'd seen earlier in the river. As I described it, their eyes widened with fear. We agreed to pack up camp first thing in the morning but morning would not come fast enough. Later that night, I was roused from my tent again by whoops and chaotic laughter from the group. They were gathered at the river's edge, chucking rocks and sticks into the water. I rushed over, convinced that they were drunkenly provoking whatever had left those gashes. Stop it, I hissed, but no one would listen. They just jeered and kept throwing things. Suddenly, a monstrous shape exploded from the black water, not 20 feet from shore. I barely glimpsed black, scaly skin and huge claws before it disappeared with a splash. Everyone froze, mouths agape. Let's get the heck out of here, Jake said shakily. No one argued. We began tearing down camp as quietly as possible, but it was too late. An earth-shaking roar boomed out of the darkness, followed by a splashing charge through the shallows, straight toward us. Panicked, I sprinted for the trail that led back to the cars. Glancing back, I saw a hulking creature haul itself from the water. It stood upright on two muscular legs, black scales glistening. Moonlight glinted off rows of sharp teeth in its elongated crocodile-like snout. Heavy claws flexed at its sides as it roared again in rage. Chaos erupted. 
My friends screamed and fled in all directions into the trees. I ran mindlessly through the darkness, hearing the beasts' bellows and the crash of trees as it rampaged after us. Heavy footfalls pounded the earth uncomfortably close at times. Finally, I burst from the tree line onto the gravel lot where we had parked. Other panicked friends were already diving into their cars. I jumped into the back seat of the closest one. Tires spun as we peeled out and went careening down the dirt road away from that cursed place. Gasping for breath, I looked back and saw a dark shape appear from the trees at the lot's edge. It raised its crocodilian head toward our fleeting taillights and let loose an enraged primal scream that will haunt my dreams forever. In the frantic days that followed, we learned that two of our friends were dead and another missing, presumably taken by the demon that dwells in the Black River. Efforts to find their remains came up empty. The authorities blamed wild animals, but we knew the truth and we vowed never to speak of the horror we had witnessed or to go anywhere near those woods again. The city was a labyrinth of narrow alleys and sprawling plazas soaked in a history that I could only appreciate through the lens of a camera. Every corner seemed steeped in a story that I couldn't fully grasp. I didn't speak the language, relying on fractured phrases and Google Translate to get by. Restaurants, museums, shopping, simple transactions aided by the ubiquity of the universal language of currency. But a deeper understanding of the place and its people eluded me. Then came that first night. Jet-lagged and restless, I wandered into the old district, away from the well-trodden paths of fellow tourists. Midnight approached. The chimes of a distant clock tower marked the hour, a dozen resonant dings echoing in the stillness. I stumbled upon a hole-in-the-wall bar sparsely populated by locals. The moment I stepped inside, something shifted. The bartender spoke, and instead of hearing unintelligible sounds, I understood him perfectly. What will you have? He asked. I answered fluently, ordering a drink in a language I didn't know I spoke. The transformation was jarring. I felt like I'd been granted access to a secret layer of the world, one that had always been there, right beyond the veil of comprehension. Conversations around me became transparent, people discussing politics, love, and the trials of everyday life. Words flowed from my mouth effortlessly, my tongue deftly navigating the syntax and grammar as if I had spoken the language all my life. My newfound ability persisted. I left the bar, wandered through the labyrinthine streets, and found myself among late night benders and night owls. I conversed with ease, each interaction deepening my connection to the city and its inhabitants. But I also felt like an imposter, trespassing in a realm that wasn't meant for me. As the sky started to brighten, a sense of dread settled in. Would my newfound ability disappear as mysteriously as it had arrived? A clock somewhere struck four, and just like that, the words became muffled, opaque, my midnight fluency had evaporated, leaving me with nothing but an aftertaste of what had been. I returned to my hotel room, a profound sense of loss mingling with wonder. For the rest of my trip, every night at the stroke of midnight, I found myself immersed in this alternate reality, a fluent stranger in a land that felt increasingly like home. And each morning the spell broke, pushing me back into the sphere of the outsider. I spoke to no one about it. Who would believe me? Who could make sense of this bizarre circadian talent? I took no videos, snapped no audio clips. It felt wrong to document what I couldn't explain. On my last night, I stayed in. I watched the city through my window, the streets slowly emptying, the sounds of a language I could temporarily call my own, filling the air 
as the clock tower struck midnight. A final evening of fluency before boarding a plane to a place where words wouldn't evade me. I left the city, carrying its alleys and midnight conversations in the inner chambers of my memory, an experience bound to time and place. I still travel, exploring other foreign lands and other tongues, but every time the clock strikes midnight, wherever I am, I'm taken back to those winding streets, to that hole-in-the-wall bar, to the people I spoke with in a language that only truly became mine in the shadowy realm between one day and the next. It was just another weekend fishing trip, the boat slicing through the ocean's surface, the sky above cloudless and blue. Hours slipped by, marked only by the gentle bobbing of the boat and the intermittent tug of a fishing line. It was tranquil, a peaceful solitude that one could only find miles away from shore. But then the sea changed, the water's surface rippled and churned as though agitated by some unseen force. My boat trembled, vibrating in a way that defied the natural movement of waves. And then it lifted, actually lifted, rising out of the water as if caught in the grip of an invisible hand. Panic clawed at my mind. I clung to the boat's sides, my eyes widening in disbelief as it continued to ascend. Higher, and higher until I was enveloped in a dense mist, so thick it swallowed everything. The sea below, the sky above, the horizon in all directions. When the mist cleared, I was no longer in the ocean I knew. I found myself in a realm both surreal and otherworldly. The water below was a hue I couldn't describe, a blend of colors not present in our spectrum shifting and shimmering in a hypnotic dance, and I wasn't alone. Aquatic beings circled my boat, their forms graceful yet alien, scaled and sleek with appendages that suggested both fins and limbs, their eyes glinting with an intelligence that was undoubtedly sentient. They seemed to communicate with each other in a series of melodic whistles and clicks their movements synchronized in a manner that suggested purpose and understanding. As I watched them, captivated yet fearful, one of the beings broke away from the group and approached me. It hovered near the boat, its eyes locking onto mine. And then, with a startling clarity, a voice entered my mind, a telepathic message formed of words yet beyond language. Observe. Do not interfere. The words were firm, commanding, and left no room for misunderstanding. Then the being turned and led the others away, diving into the depths, disappearing into the alien waters. Shaken, I grasped the boat's edge, my fingers gripping the wood as if it were my only anchor to reality. What had just happened? What was this place? Questions whirled through my mind, each unanswered as I sat adrift in this realm. But then, just as suddenly as it had lifted, the boat descended. The mist returned, thicker than before, obscuring everything. When it finally cleared, I was back in familiar waters, the coastline visible in the distance. I steered the boat back to shore, my hands shaking, my mind struggling to process the experience. When I finally reached solid ground, I checked my fishing gear. Among the nets and tackle, I found a scale. A single, iridescent scale unlike that of any fish. It shimmered with the same indescribable colors I had seen in that other sea. I kept the scale in a locked box, tangible proof that what I experienced was real. But sometimes, when I'm alone, I hear it. A faint melody of whistles and clicks, as if carried by the wind. And when I sleep, I dream of that aquatic realm, 
those beings forever etched into my subconscious? Did they bring me there to observe, to bear witness to their existence? Or was it a warning, a signal to never venture too far into the depths? I don't know. What I do know is that the ocean no longer feels the same. When I look out at the vast expanse of water, I can't shake the feeling that something out there is watching, waiting. And the scale in that locked box, it still shimmers, its colors ever shifting, as if resonating with a realm far beyond our understanding. 